business to us is to try and create a vehicle in which we can have fun and do beautiful things. Episode 108. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I had the great pleasure of visiting the new home of Squire and Partners in the department store, Brixton, South London. I got to sit down with partner Henry Squire, who knows the practice quite intimately, seeing as he has grown up with the the architects in the office, um, as he's the son of founding partner, Michael Squire. So... Henry and I, we discussed his own career, we discussed the history of Squires, and we really focused in on how the extraordinary new home, the department store, how that has changed and shaped the business and has created a new future for Squire and Partners. We discussed how the project was conceived, um, its procurement, the role of Squire and Partners being the developer and the owner of the project, um, the business case for it, how it was seeking to enhance and contribute and fit in to the local community. So this is a really fascinating insight into one of the leading architectural practices in the UK and if you get the opportunity to go and visit the department store it's got all sorts of um, you know some brilliant things that you can go and visit and interact with and they've got a great uh, you know bar at the top of it and it was just really really probably one of the coolest if not the coolest architectural office I have ever visited so sit back relax and enjoy Henry Squire. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business, and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far and with your permission, of course, what might be next? What what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Henry, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. We're here in the department store, which is the home of Squire and Partner in, in Brixton. Um, an absolutely incredible development that you guys have, have been involved in um, and it's kind of really brought a, a new lease of life to the entire area. Um, and you're one of the partners here at, at Squire's. You've been, how long have you been here? 20 years or so? Well, um, ever since I was well, born, born one way or another. Yeah, yeah. So, so obviously <laughs> exactly. your, your, your father, exactly. Michael, is the, exactly. the founding yeah. partner. Yeah. So you've been... Here since boy, yeah. Exactly. yeah it's, one it's, way or another, yeah. yeah you've you've, you've yeah. been here from the beginnings. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it's... We just had this amazing tour around this building and development, which is, you know, really very inspiring, extraordinary. Um, and... Quite interesting because you, as as a organisation, have kind of blurred this line between being client, developer, and the owner of of the building. How did it? How did this project come about? What what caused the the desire to move from the King's Cross offices and and relocate here? Um, <clears throat> I think well. The very simple answer is necessity. We, we had outgrown King's Cross. We were in three or four buildings um, scattered around King's Cross and we were desperate to all be back together again as one family. Um, we didn't necessarily think we would ever be able to buy our own building. Um, we were originally looking to rent somewhere, somewhere different. We looked all, all over London, looked at lots of different places. But there's a history of development within the practice. Um, um, Dad has been 
doing developments slightly outside of the practice, but privately with um, a friend of his for many, many years. Mm. So there's always been that DNA of doing a bit of development. And then um, we started to do it within the, the practice. So we did, a, we did a few developments before we, we bought this building. And I think it's a wonderful thing for architects to do because I think it, it's really important to um, understand the power of your own pencil. Um, and when you're paying for it yourselves, all of the decisions, you know, you really have to think about. And I think that's what quite a lot of clients like about us is that we do genuinely, because we've done it, we do understand um, the power of the pencil and try to always think about does it add value, does it add value. Um, so a mixture of two things really, well three things. One was the opportunity we found this building by, you know, luck or whatever. Um, we needed to move. Um, and we had a history and a confidence of doing development. So this wasn't our first foray. This would have been a very big one to do. Yeah. Uh, if it had been the first time you'd ever done it. But, um, you know, Dad's been doing it for a long time. We'd done a few. So we did sort of understand the mechanics of the financial side of doing it. So the, the development has always been part of the business model of, of Squires? When I say business, not business model. Dad's always done them. Right. Okay. Very much actually slightly well in the early years slightly outside of the business but obviously using the business as the architect but with a in JV with a builder friend right um, so it's quite a good thing an architect and a builder joint venturing together on a development has its tensions obviously as it does even when they're not involved financially together but I think you know you've got two people bringing very different skills to the to the thing and and, um, uh, and so yes there was a history of it and it's certainly something that when we um, when I say we, me, Tim and Murray, the younger partners, um, came into the firm in a, in a meaningful way as partners, we wanted to kind of do that and bring it into the firm as well. Mm. And so how did you come about this this building? How did it...? Um, well, in our London-wide search, a friend of mine um, said, uh, oh, Henry, uh, you should go down and have a look at this building in Brixton. It, it was sort of advertised as being for sale, but I think we were way behind and it had already been bought by someone. Um, but we came down and you just sort of, I think because we were, when I say we, Dad and I, and actually Tim as well, one of our other partners in South London, um, but, you know, Dad and I clap them. So we knew Brixton very well. We knew how exciting it was. We found this building and just knew it was special even at the time when it was a complete ruin and all of that we just knew there was something very special about it um and we then reasonably aggressively pursued it <laughs> <laughs> and and what was the you know because it's 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 an, a very unique development and you were kind of showing me around earlier and the the curation of the tenants that you have the other businesses that are involved from the vinyl shop next door to the coffee shop as well, this is it, it's been carefully thought about and not kind of. It's very different from a lot of other developments that would be going around, you know, particularly up in Battersea or in in the area. What was some of the thinking behind behind that, and how did you kind of develop a business case for the entire the entire site? Well, I think in terms of business case, to be completely frank with you, day one. You know, no, a developer wouldn't have done what we've done. Yeah, um, we we were able to take a much longer term view. You know, so we were able to take a twenty year view, if mm. you like, um, which is huge respect to my old man for letting us do that because you know it, it, he could have taken a shorter term view, um, but he didn't. He's let us take that view, so we were able to do something that we th thought brought value both to the community and to the building over a slightly longer term. Um, and uh, in terms of the curation of the, the retail, I mean, retail is slightly struggling anyway, it's well documented. Um, and what we wanted to do was to reignite a part of Brixton that was completely derelict and boarded up. So whilst rent was important, um, culture was more important. Mm. And so, um, and, and integrating with the local community because, you know, if you bring something that the local community doesn't want, this is not big enough to be destination. So if the local people aren't going to come here, then you've got dead retail. So, you know, Claudia, for example, um, A, I share, I have a love for music, um, as we were talking about earlier. Um, I'm in a band. Um, Brixton has formed a very 
big part of my youthful adventures, um, the fridge and all of that, oh, yeah. and Soul to Soul, <laughs> Jazzy B and Soul to Soul and the, and the Academy. So when we were thinking about retail, I would I just love to have a record shop. Maybe it's a bit selfish and, and a vanity thing, but also it is kind of what Brixton is about. So, um, you know, we met Claudia, who's just the most wonderful person, and uh, she was up for coming. So um, having Pure Vinyl kind of brought brought the local community with us, but also connected the building to Brixton. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the Kabula is a friend of my sister's um, who was starting out a catering company. So it's kind of a familial thing, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, you know, every little street needs a little cafe. Um, Volcano, the coffee shop was really about, um, we're in the business of making mm. things. So we quite like other people that are in the business of making things. and. These guys bring the raw coffee beans over from wherever they bring them, South America. They roast, they blend, they grind, they, they, they make coffee. They don't act, you can't actually go in there and buy a coffee. Um, but they then send that out to, um, you know, some of the high end restaurants and hotels. And Canova Hall, um, was about curating a cafe sort of that. So we were originally going to operate it ourselves as a sort of, I suppose, like a kind of, Ivy French bistro type feel. Right. We wanted that kind of really open, open feel. Um, but we found a tenant who I think they were I don't know, even they might have had one just opened in in um, uh, Shoreditch. But they were very new, very young company, very bad covenant in some ways. But we backed them because they had a design ethos and, and all that. So we had better offers from maybe more stable covenants. But for yes. us, it was about culture more than rent. So I'm coming back to that point that we wanted to create a little area of Brixton that had that sort of village feel. And it, it's really interesting that you, you're saying, you know, that the focus on culture and the long-term business plan, like the 20-year mm -hmm. plan, and that do you find that often the clients that you work with historically or clients who are, you know, maybe not your client, but clients that are involved in these types of regeneration projects um, have a much shorter view? And do you think that this can now be used as as like more evidence or do you use it as evidence to, with, with working with new potential clients of, of taking a longer frame? I don't know about that. I mean, obviously some of the projects that we work on take, you know, Chelsea Barrett's we've been working on for 10 years so far and it's probably got at least another 10. So there are some very long projects that we work mm. on and I definitely wouldn't say that it's not the clients don't take a, a long view. It's that we were able, because we were a pre-let, right? So we had, we were able to demonstrate to the bank that the mechanics worked, but the day one that we finished this development, we were kind of in a break-even position, which, right. is, which was fine for us, but for other developers, you have to show to their investors or to their shareholders or have to show a profit maybe a bit earlier than that. Um, they have to think about it differently. That's not to say that they wouldn't have taken the same decisions about the retail right. and stuff like that, but just in, in terms of perhaps the way the deal is structured, maybe the money you spend <laughs> in doing it, all these kind of things, yeah. in buying it. I mean, we were able to buy it because we were able to say, well, what would a, any, what would the person who owns it be looking for as a profit? Right, well, we'll take that. You know, we were able to kind of say, well, we don't need profit. We were able to think of it as an investment, long-term investment deal. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say that some of our clients wouldn't you know, go with us on the journey if we, of, of, of curating the retail in this way. It was more just how we were able to purchase the building Got it. was by paying a price that didn't have a development profit built into it, Got sort it. of at the end of it. So we were able to, therefore, I think when the, the people we were buying off were looking at the offer we made, they were going, well, we have to take this amount of risk and all this, and we may still not be as well off as if we took this now. So yeah. that was that was really what I was meaning about. Yes, that. okay. That um, and I'm sure, you know, we know that there are other clients who are very good at crafting retail, like Shaftesbury, people like that, done around Covent Garden and places like that. So, it, but, you know, we just, we really believed in it and believed in this culture of, of trying to say that the we don't let the retail rat wag the dog. You know, the, the retail will be there and hopefully it will be successful. You want it to be successful. So there's no point in driving very high rents or all of that. And if you've got a nice successful retail, that brings value to the main part of the building, which is the offices. So 
it's a way of, say, breaking even on the retail to increase the value for the offices. Right, okay. Rather than having loads of shops that are either empty or don't work or bad tenants and that brings the value yeah. down. And, and obviously as well because it's, it's a unique development in the sense that it's your home. Yeah. And, and so obviously the... Okay, well, talk, talk a little bit about that, about the... Has there been a culture shift then from the actual physical changing offices or how, how has, has that been a kind of planned or what's, what's the discussions been like internally? Yeah, I mean, it definitely, I mean, whether it's been good for the productivity of the office, I'm, I'm, <laughs> the jury is definitely out. I wonder whether we weren't more efficient when we were in the machine of King's Cross, you know, <laughs> King's Cross was our sort of white box, very cool, super contemporary machine for working in. Now we're home and it's all got a little bar upstairs and a, and a nice roof terrace and, you know, we do yoga downstairs and, and all of this kind of stuff. So it's very much a more um, kind of relaxed atmosphere. Um, we wanted it to feel very different in terms of, you know, oh God, I'm not coming into an office, I'm coming into a lovely space that mm -hmm. I like to work in. Um, the jury's slightly out as to whether that is... Whether, you know, in terms of raw efficiency, people work better when it's just, well, there's nothing else to see here or do here, so I may as well just work. <laughs> or whether, oh, well, I can pop upstairs and have a nice coffee on the terrace. And so, you know, quality of life may be better. Efficiency, jury's out. Well, it's, it's interesting as well, isn't it? Because I suppose architecture is one of these disciplines as well where the kind of facilitating social interaction and conversation in a, in a sort of gentle way as well breeds a kind of creative atmosphere as well yeah. where we're like where where you are actually able to come up with again this is a very difficult thing to kind of quantify or even measure but like the quality of thinking or mm. you know how much does, does does the space change i don't think there's any doubt that that coming here has changed definitely people's perception of us right um, for sure. I think a lot of people were very surprised by this building and that it was because I think we were known for a certain thing and then I think we'd always been trying to say we do other things but it's always difficult, you know, it's a bit like that chicken and egg thing of like, well, until someone lets you do it, you can't mm. show that you can do it. So then we've done it for ourselves and now people are giving us other work. So I definitely think that it's changed that. I, I think... I hope it's changed the way people feel about coming to work. I hope people are now coming to a place that they really love coming to and, and, and working in. And I slightly jest about the efficiency thing. I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's just as good, but definitely a very conscious decision. And we had a company called Space Syntax who came and sort of did a bit of work with us and how we moved around our our old offices and how we wanted to move around these offices and yeah, the, the research department right? yeah exactly and so we kind of mapped out well because we used to have printers at the end of each row of desks in the old office now we put our printers very purposefully at either end of each floor so people have to get up from their desk walk maybe have that interaction with someone at the printer while they're right. waiting for their print to come out so all these little things and having breakout spaces by every single bank of desks because before in the old office we didn't have many places to actually go and get the drawings out and sit and sketch and talk um, so all of these things are, are trying to foster a much more kind of a, a get off the computer mm. and sit down and get a drawing out and talk and debate and discuss and design because I think the computer is great for some things, but I also think there is a malaise or a disease that people think, I've come in, I've switched my computer on, I'm doing a day's work. Whereas actually, I think design and architecture should be a lot more about communication with people um, than it is just interfacing with the yes. screen, which is important at times. But, well, th th this is interesting, actually, because it's kind of the basis of all you know business. And I talk a lot about in the business of architecture here about how business really is conversation isn't it's the sort of mm. structures that we have mm. to facilitate conversations how how has the new environment been received by your clients or how how do you now use it in terms of um portraying what you what work that you can do and also their involvement in actually coming to the yeah, offices yeah i mean i think um Definitely, we noticed that more clients are happy to come to our office now than maybe they were before. So, oh yeah, well, yeah, we'll have a meeting at the department store, no problem. So, I think you know people enjoy coming here, um, which is which is fantastic. Um, we've done some uh, 
client presentations in that quit space and pin all the work up on the things and try and make it feel like it's more of a a, a, a jury rather than just on a screen mm. with uh, you know PowerPoint. Um, so um, there's definitely a lot of that. But I think and I think in terms of the work we're getting and in terms of clients' perception, as I said before, that's definitely changed. And I think you know people really now think of us as a creative practice um, or a different type of creative practice than maybe we were thought of before. Um, and maybe also kind of see us see what we can do with interiors. Mm. Um, whereas before, perhaps, you know, they maybe thought of us as exteriors. Um, but I think mainly it's to do with staff. You know, a lot, a lot of this has been uh, about, um, maybe, you know, they are, staff in any business is probably the most important asset. Client, yeah. Clients are very important, but actually, you know, they will come and go. They will, will fall out of favour or whatever, but you hope that you retain your staff over many, many years. So, giving them somewhere that they feel proud to come and work in and inspired and those kind of things. That's what this has really been about. That's really interesting. Did it, was there a lot of, how did you involve, how did you involve 250 people <laughs> in the, you know, and with a large majority of those being architects who have got strong opinions about how space should be? Well, we out? did and we did and we didn't, obviously. I mean, at the beginning, we, we held these series of kind of, crits for want of a better word where we would bring up a subject like desks or uh, what, what do you want from your office space or, or all sorts of things and we ran these little not competitions but everyone was allowed to come with ideas we pinned them up on the wall we all debated them some people said oh we want this little area we want that you know we'd love to do this and so that happened quite a lot at the beginning of mm. the process. So I would say for the first three or four months, we, we, we did involve um, people within the office um, quite a lot then. Then obviously you've just got to get on and do it and you've then got to narrow it down into a little team and they've got to believe and everyone else has got to trust. You can't involve 250 people throughout the whole process. Um, but we did, um, we do, certainly did at the beginning try to find out what was important to them and then try to incorporate that wherever possible. And you were saying that um, it kind of changes the appearance or perception of the business to other clients. Has it been a way of you being able to um, win new types of work or enter into new sectors? Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we did a um, club workspace for the Ministry of Sound, their first, um, you know, workspace. I don't think we would have got that job had we not done this project. They came round, they thought it was great, um, and you know, they saw it fitted with their kind of brand. Um, so, and and quite a lot of that, quite a lot on the um, interior side and the office side, obviously because this is an office. Mm. But I think just just maybe even just more generally. Um, even if we haven't worked with some of the clients that may think it now, I think generally in the marketplace, people raised an eyebrow and have thought, oh, okay, they do that kind of thing. I didn't realize that. I didn't think of them as like that. So I think it surprised people. Um, and I think we've definitely won some different work off it. And, and I hope, you know, it came, we moved at a sort of, reasonably difficult time politically and economically yes um so had we moved you know you know three years before that or something maybe we would have seen a much bigger change mm. you know but we've been through you know quite difficult times as we've done this move so um in some ways it meant that we got a lot of noise because we were the only sort of positive story coming out um when everyone was saying oh, it's all doom and gloom so um yeah so through the, it was interesting because you, you've obviously you've had a long, almost a lifetime worth of experience of seeing the practice grow and evolve. How has it, what have been the sort of key changes in the last, you know, over that time, do you think of how the practice has evolved from where it was from your first involvement or even experiencing it as a child? Um... Well, I mean, the obvious one is, is, is clearly size. And I think the one thing we're wrestling with probably right now is that in some ways it, we like to think it actually hasn't changed at all. Mm. It's still a family business. 
when you're 10, it's very easy to have a family business. When you're 30 people, it's very easy to have a family business. When you're 60, it's quite easy. When you're 100, it gets a bit more difficult. When you're 200. So, you know, that's the one worry that we have is that, you know, you lose that touch with everyone. You, you become a corporate machine, those kind of things. Um, but in some ways, we, we still believe, even though probably it has, and we're slightly hoping it hasn't, but it has, we, we still think it's that it's, we have to have a structure because you have to have a structure for 250 people, but we like to think anyone can come and talk to me. It's not that terrifying thing. It's, it's flat in terms of how you feel your opinion is valued and yeah. all these kind of things. Um, so, you know, obviously size, we, we probably haven't changed as much as we should bearing in mind that we're a business of this size, you know, for example, we don't actually have an official HR department. We still do HR very personally. Right. You know, us and the directors deal with people directly. We don't like to have this sort of other department where you go in and it's all written in a book and this is the way you do it. We try and make it personal, like a family business mm. would. Those kind of, you know, that's a small example, but those kind of things. Whereas I'm sure probably for a company, we should have all these very corporate things, but we try to keep ourselves still in that familial feel that, you know, you're coming into a family, you're not coming into a corporate business. Yeah. And what, what have been the sort of the changes and challenges as you've grown as a business? Because often like as a, as a young business, you know, it's winning the first few clients and then, you know, once you get those few first clients, then it's kind of figuring out how to deliver them. And then you get to a kind of size, like this was quite a mature practice what sort of current obstacles that you face now that are very different to some of the ones that you know perhaps when I suppose um I think it, it's my dad who, or my granddad or my dad talking about my granddad saying something that I had this sort of period in my life where I was always told that I wasn't quite there yet in terms of experience or architectural size or I'm not quite there yet and then you have a few years and then suddenly you're, well, yeah, you're too big. You're, we're looking for the young guns now. <laughs> and, and you're like, well, where's that little, there's only <laughs> like, sweet there's a tiny little window where you're in that little sweet spot. Oh, they're the young guns, but they've made it big so that you could use it. But now, oh, well, we know about them. They're sort of old. So I suppose the challenge is now to keep it fresh, mm. to, um, you know, keep, you know, we are, transitioning into the second generation of this practice. How do we transition into the third? You know, at, at um, whatever I am now, 47, you know, I suppose that's still quite young for an architect, but equally, you know, turn around and you're 60 and then you've got to be looking for where the youngster, that's not actually that far away. Yeah. 30 years is nothing really. So you've got to keep it fresh. You've got to keep the ideas evolving, um, never stand still. Rolling Stone gathers no moss and all that kind of stuff. Um, try not to get too set in your ways. Keep keep being open minded, flexible. This is, that is a challenge with a two hundred and fifty you know a person practice. Um, I suppose also you know you've got to make sure that you keep the quality going all the way through. Yeah, and you're really on top of those kind of things, um, which. You know, I think we still do. We really do think of ourselves as a design practice, not a delivery practice, not a commercial practice. In you know, in in so far as we'll just take, you know, maybe someone else's design and work it up and work and draw it. Right. So we don't do those kind of things. Um, so design is really passionate to us, and and I suppose you know, keeping connected with the with the staff because I think when we were, and maybe you know, we were ten, fifteen years younger than so we were maybe a little bit more. Um, badly behaved than we are these days but you know that's the, the thing that's been really important as we've all grown up together you know mm. and that is myself the three younger partners younger whatever and the directors we're all very similar ages and we've all grown up in this practice together mm. um, how do um, but we all grown up going to chads and going out together and really living and breathing work and play together how do we keep that culture in the next generation so that they're all growing up together and feeling that they're advancing through the practice, um, keeping it fresh all the way up to the top? You know. 
And, and what's it been like? I mean, you're saying that your your grandfather was an architect, and yeah. your, your father obviously. Um, what's it been like working with family, like <laughs> actual family? Because this That's is the six billion dollar question. This is the one that maybe we'll have to say, <laughs> no, don't, don't put that in. <laughs> okay, fine. No, it's fine. <laughs> And there's nothing I'll say here that dad hasn't heard. It, it's, it's definitely tough, right? There's working with family, particularly because I think dad and I are very similar and very close. Mm. Um, and, you know, when you grow up idolizing your dad, right? You know, I'm sure most people do one way or another. Um, how do you build enough confidence where you've, you've got to say, I've got to, can't be seen to just be the boss's son here. Yeah. I've got to be my own person. I need to have the respect of clients and people in this office. I hope I have that. I don't know, but I hope I have that where they go, oh yeah, H can do it. It's not just because he's he hasn't made it just because he's the boss's son. Yeah. So then at some stage, you slightly have to take the old man on and you have to say, well, we've got to do it my way now. And that can be difficult. And, but, and we have had some tough times, but in fairness, you know, I think both of us love and respect each other enough that even if we have some arguments, we'll go away, we'll bruise on it for a few days, and then we'll come back and we'll realise that, you know, it's all fine and we, we'll find a way through. Um, but I think working with family is, dif- is difficult because you, you know how to hurt each other in a way that, yeah. you know, perhaps you wouldn't, you know, if you're just having a senior partner, junior partner relationship if you have that with father and son you can go at each other to a level that you probably wouldn't do if if you didn't have that relationship so it's positive and negative I think you know I hope we've brought some good changes to the firm um we and and now it's fantastic you know it's fantastic to have someone who's been really done it been through you know huge ups and downs been through two big recessions yeah um watched his father make mistakes. Um, granddad had practices all over the world, um, very global. RSP, as it's now called, Rag and Squire Partners, what it was, is still the biggest architectural practice in Southeast Asia, or one of them anyway. Mm. Always about three or 4,000 people out of Singapore. It's nothing to do with us anymore, but granddad went bust quite a few times in his life. So dad, I think, learned lessons about international offices and things like that. Um, so... Um, I would say that you know it's it's challenging, but it but it but it's been incredible. I think, and um, the one good thing I think about it, well, there's many good things, but one of the good things is that you can also forgive each other. Mm. I think in a way that maybe some of the things that have been said, he might have said to another partner, you know, <laughs> <laughs> holding on to that well, one, get yeah, out, right. But yeah. we've been able, we've been able to challenge each other and you do forgive afterwards and so but now it's now it's really great and we have a f- phenomenal relationship but it was tough as we I was trying to find my way and he was you know so, trying to let me but also you know so, so was it always always kind of destined for you then to be an architect no, definitely, growing, no growing I definitely up? didn't want to be an architect I fought against it so <laughs> that was half the problem I kept fighting against it so I didn't want to do the degree I wanted to be a rock star um, yes, <laughs> and, all, and all of that. Yeah. I know that. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> or, or an actor, um, or actually, I applied to do English and history, and I wanted it. Or I was going to teach poetry to kids. I really wanted to do that as well. And uh, and then, I'm pretty sure how it happened, but I think my something happened while I was uh, travelling in between school and university, where I ended up with a place at Oxford, Brooks or Poly, as it was then, um, to read architecture, which I definitely didn't apply for. Um, <laughs> so they quite, quite Someone, sh- a letter went somewhere for- <laughs> something happened and other places didn't happen and that did so I sort of well okay fine I'll, I'll do the degree I did the degree and then I was going to I don't know what I, was, I think I was going to convert to law or something like that something miserable like that um, maybe don't put that <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and then I got a place at the Royal College of Art um and I thought, well, I just can't turn down yeah. two years to go there. I may as well do that. Um, and I, I had a great time there and I enjoyed that immensely. And then I thought, well, I may as well qualify now. I've done six. So then I qualified and then I built a building with that um, 10 over place. And then I said, right, that's it. I'm out. I've done it. I've built a building. I'm gone. 
And I was then going to, I then left for three or four years and set up the imaginatively called Henry Squire Management. <laughs> what was I thinking? Um, and I was going to do property development. Right. Um, and uh, still do the band and stuff like that and uh, keep that dream alive, although it was dying pretty slowly, slow, painful death. Um, and then dab on some big projects and in that way that fathers can do when you're very close to them and you're a little bit drunk up a mountain in Kenya, persuaded me to come and build this very big building, um, Belgrave House in Victoria. And I was quite attracted by the idea that maybe I should build one as an architect, big one. Yeah. So I came back and did that and then I haven't been back, but I sort of tried to leave a couple more times <laughs> after that. And so I've fought against it quite a lot. And I think maybe that was all part of trying to find my own way, trying yeah. not to be the boss's son, trying to know what, what did my life mean as opposed to just being under the, you know, he's quite a powerful figure and quite a successful person. So it's quite hard to, to, to know whether you can live up to that, whether you're mm. always just going to be the boss's son. Um, and then, you know, I think now, you know, we're, we're it, it's good. So no, it definitely wasn't, it definitely wasn't my plan anyway. Maybe it was someone else's plan <laughs> always from the beginning, but it definitely wasn't my plan, um, to, to set out on this road. And it took me quite a long time to fall in love with it, I think. But, yeah. um, I now do love it. Um, I love what I do. Um, I love the, the business of architecture, the, uh, I've always described it as, um, there's a story, when I did this thing, Belgrave House, with the uh, Grover Estate, in one day, in the morning, the Duke um, came to site, and it was all agreed that as the project architect, I would show him around, so the old you know, suit on, all that kind of stuff, he came in, we, we walked around his building site, and um, he, he, uh, he was very gracious and all that kind of stuff. And then he left and then took the suit off, put the old clothes on, had to go to a site meeting down in the basement. And this guy with the spider's web tattoo with the t-shirt off and the builder's bum thing um, had built this block work wall in the wrong place. And I had to tell him, I'm really sorry, mate, but you built that in the wrong place. Um, and I, was, I remember coming out at the end of that day and going to the pub with the contractor, just thinking, what a day I've met. One of the richest men in the world. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the bricky, um, on site and these people, you know, from all walks of life and everyone in between, everyone in between you meet as an architect, you know, consultants, uh, craftspeople, carpenters, you know, even just in this building, as I was saying to you before, mm -hmm. sharing with people that make things. I think what, the way I've described it in some ways is it's a bit like being, um, the composer and a conductor of an orchestra. You write this piece of music, right? And you have a vision of it in your mind. And then you bring in all these people, all who are way better at it than you are. They know way more about playing music than you do. Mm. And they bring this thing to life in a way that you couldn't imagine it, right? You write this note, but then someone plays it in a way that you hadn't pictured it, but they've pictured it in a different way. Yeah. And it's better. And that's the magic of architecture and what I've really grown to love is it's it's the collaborative nature of all these unbelievable people that you meet from all walks of life whether they're on site doing it whether they're consultants whether, whatever it is and so that's the real joy of it. Amazing and that, that kind of begins to describe like the relationship that Squire has with with the business aspect of, of architecture for you what what would you what how would you describe that how would you describe what what does what does business mean to Squire and Partners? I, I think it, it, it's, it is obviously a business, but it's, we don't see it as business in so far as it, it almost feels like when you say business, I suppose the ultimate aim of business is to make money. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but maybe that's what someone might define it as. I don't know. For us, it's to do fantastic architecture, have fun, do beautiful things. Um, be a family, be a good spirit, and hopefully make some money. So I don't know when you say, what does business mean to Squam Partners? We, we're running a business. It's a pretty yeah. hardcore business um, in terms of, you know, how to run it. It's complicated. We've structured it in a very, you know, complicated way in some ways. But um, even this place, 
it wasn't a pure business decision. In some ways, it was actually trying to protect the long-term future of the practice. We're now no longer in the uh, grips of a landlord. So, you know, we're not in that constant upwardly only rent reviews, even if our business is not doing so well. Um, so business to us is to try and create a vehicle in which we can have fun and do beautiful things. And so the dream might be one day, if we ever get to the point, maybe not in my lifetime, but maybe the next lucky people who take it over, we've paid all the debt down on this building. We've got income coming from, you know, the, the little rental bits and the bit behind. And we can sit here with 20 people if we want and just do wonderful projects that we want to do yeah. because we have enough income from this to pay ourselves and our staff and the architecture can now be fun. Yes. Um, <laughs> so and maybe that's what business No, that, that, that's perfect. And it kind of, I suppose that, that question was quite a broad question. And, you know, I, I'm always interested in talking with practices about what is the relationship to, to what, is it, what does business mean for you? And architects, you know, pretty much every single architect I ever meet, they're, you know, they're not, not that they're not in it to make money, but they, it's not the sole reason why you get up in the morning to do your work. You can't be because the money is not phenomenally great relative mm. to other professions. If you think of lawyers and things like that, you know, architects, um, you have to do this for love. You, you really do. Um, and um, do, you, do you think our fees are, are not high enough or is it? I, th I, I think it's a complicated question, that one, because, you know, I, I think if you think of the value that we create sometimes, mm. um, you know, if you get a phenomenal planning or something like that, you know, the value you create um, through, you know, to a large degree, your skill, what you bring, your housing negotiation, your design flair, these kind of things, you know, you, you really do create something pretty special, particularly at that planning moment. Mm. Um, and I think relatively, and I've even had some clients say to me, you know, it's, it's crazy what you guys charge in some ways. You, you could charge a lot more than that. Then when I try it, they go, well, no, because I can get it from <laughs> him for, for a lot cheaper. So, you know, there, there's one thing that they say, you know, that's what they do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do think that the architectural profession is not very well paid compared to the hours that you have to put in, the numbers of people you have to employ, the risk you take, the PI cover you have to have, um, the responsibilities you take. Um, I don't think it's, it's very well rewarded, but I think in some ways as a profession, we're to blame for that as much as anybody else. So, so, you know, we're not very united as a profession when, um, they broke up the, they set up the ARB and you know, spit, spit that off and mm -hmm. uh, broke up the scale fees and all those kind of things. We all just now undercut each other ruthlessly. Um, uh, and I think to a degree, perhaps we've also let go quite a lot of the things that we used to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think back in my granddad's day, you were the cost consultant, the project manager, the the maybe not the structure engineer, but you know, you, you did a lot more and we've abrogated a lot of that to, to elsewhere and say we only want to be about design. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think there's a degree to which we need to take on some of these other responsibilities. Um, for, for, for you and the, and the future of, of Squires, how do you see, you know, as um, the industry progressing or how can architects begin to is it is it the future for us to kind of take back some of those roles or is the future more to be more entrepreneurial and you know be involved in actual you know get involved in developments where you can actually you know reap the benefits of those types of projects over a longer period of time i think it would we would love to do more of that the only problem with that a bit is that you have to be very careful that you don't start competing with your clients and if you do then they start going well not we'll use them then mm. because they're trying to buy the same site we're trying to buy and all those kind of things so you have to know what are you are you a development company that has architects in-house or are you an architecture company that does a bit of development yes. yeah and, and i think it's quite difficult to so 
it could be, a, I mean, you know, that's one route we could go. We could say we're going full into development and we only do our own stuff and maybe some other people might use us a bit, but they won't, but we've got to now. But then you've put a huge burden on the amount of development you've got to do to feed 250 people. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure that it's that. It, it could it could be a, a bit to do with that. I, I just think that, um, I think that, I hope that AI and computers and all this won't take over design, you know, that quickly. They probably could in a formulaic way, but I still do think that there is a creative thing that happens. Um, but I, I believe that architects should be taking some of these things back. I think it's slightly strange, and that's not to say that we don't use them and really respect them, that we don't that we have to go to a planning consultant, for example. Mm. We should have that expertise in-house. Um, so I think that, you know, the, as the world's got more complex, more industries have sprung up around these things. And I think that we would probably benefit as a business if we had a few more of these things in-house. Not maybe structures and m and that's very big disciplines, but, yes. you, know, you know, fire and... Um, you know, um, perhaps, um, you know, cladding consultants. And things like well, that. it was interesting you were saying that you've got branding experts and interiors now mm-hmm. in-house working with you. How does that, how does that as a, as a service and the sort of relationships operate? Um, well, I think it, 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 it's great. I mean, I, I never... There's a, there's a kind of traditionally outside of the remit of the architect. But well, I think traditionally is what the architect used to do. You look right. at, well, look at Corbusier. I mean, he's doing paintings, he's designing chairs, he's designing, you know. The thought that Corbusier would let someone else do the interior of Ronchon because he's not, an, you know, I don't know where it happened. Yeah. Somewhere in the 90s or the 2000s, suddenly this thing of interior architecture I understood interior design in some ways, you know, and by that I mean with the greatest respect, going back a long way, it was the FF&E, but still architects were doing reception desks or, or the kitchens and bathrooms and all that. Yeah. And suddenly that kind of went away as well. And then interior architecture came in and then architects only, or some architects only wanted to do the outsides and don't want to do all the insides of buildings, mm. maybe because it's quite a complicated m coordination pain that a lot of people don't want to take on for very good reasons. But... To me, architecture with the capital A is, is not just the outside of buildings. Um, you know, we design those little things that are holding the tea bags. And if you go to any architect's house, uh, you know, before you, you know, they care about the chairs and the, what knives and forks they've got. And they've probably got eater their glasses. And, you know, there's a thing they care about design and all things. They haven't gone to an interior designer to, to, yeah. to tell them what to have. So, um, I think that, you know, for us, it's always been about everything, but the world did change. And so we had to, we kept saying, no, we, we do interiors, but because we didn't have an interior design department, we kept not being given them. So we set up an interior design department mm. so that we could say we did it. It's actually, well, it was set up by one of our architects, Maria, who's um, incredibly talented. So she is actually an architect. Obviously, we do have other interior designers now in there. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we, the other way that an architectural practice can go is to think of itself as design. That's what we do. We've even slightly taken architecture off and calling ourselves designers. Right. Um, because it's product design, it's furniture design, it's we're doing installation design, sculptures, all sorts of things. So one of an answer to your previous question about how it could go, maybe, yeah. is that you branch out a bit from what is now perceived as just, oh, you just get me planning, do the outside, into, no, we do everything. We'll, we'll do your ff and we'll do your branding, we'll do your um, marketing, we can even curate your artwork if you've got artwork. Things. So we mm-hmm. just, we expand into everything design related and have people you know, that can all passionate about all of those kind of things, metal workers, maybe you know, all of these kind of things. So maybe that's another route for, for us to go. And what's, what's, what's in store for the rest of 2020 for Squires? I wish I, wish I had that crystal ball. <laughs> um, with, the, these days it's pretty hand to mouth. I've got to say that, that you know, in, in, in you know, five, six years ago, it's quite different, but mm. we are in a different world and a different atmosphere. There's been a lot of, you know, madness going on with all sorts of various things, which are all very well documented, um, which has had an effect on, on our industry. Um, you know, the, 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 the the planning system is incredibly complicated and all those kind of things now. So 
I hope that um, we will begin to see more projects start on site. Yeah. Um, after the last three years, there's been you know a, a bit of a bit of nervousness about all those kind of things. Um, we've got some very exciting projects you know coming to an end, um, like Chelsea Barracks and things like that, which I hope you know will start to show what we can do. Um, we've got some <clears throat> really exciting new ones um, coming along. So but it's, both, it's, it's an in, in conversation as well. Like how how has what's been some, some of the sort of secrets for Squires to being able to weather various economic changes over such a long period of time? Well, we haven't weathered it completely. Um, in 2007, eight, yeah, we were 60 people. And then in 2016, we, we weathered it just, but we did actually reduce purely by just not employing and we had, you know, natural people leaving and going away. So we've always, I think the way we weather those kind of times is we are very close to the numbers. And when I say that, mm. you know, it's not about business, we take the business incredibly seriously. We are constantly reviewing our cash flow. We are constantly reviewing work numbers. We try to manage um, responsibly looking forward. So by employment. So we, we really, nobody likes the business of redundancies and all that kind of stuff. So if we can see that things aren't going well, we just say no employment. We do have people leaving. You know, people do out of 250, they're going back to... Europe or wherever it is there. So then we're able to control the numbers a bit right, that way. Okay. Um, we do have some rental income coming in from this and from other developments that we've done. Yeah. So that helps to support the business a bit in, mm. in bad times. We can, we can, you know, it, it's not hugely significant, but it is, it is there. So that helps to prop up, prop up the business. So we've, we're trying to get ourselves into a position where you know, we have some income that underpins a base stability for the practice and we do, and that's something, you know, again, that dad has been really instrumental in drilling into us. We, we're never going to, well, touch would be that practice that wakes up and goes, oh my God, we've, we're, we're done. Yeah. You know, we chase our fees very ruthlessly. We watch our cash flow incredibly carefully and we try to manage that which we can manage, overheads and all those kind of things. And we try to be as efficient. We're having a big efficiency drive at the moment. We've done a big thing with all the directors. We had a whole day with a management consultant and went through how do we, you know, the world's getting more competitive on fees and all this. How do we, if other firms can do it for that, why can't we? Mm. We should be able to. So how do we do it for the prices that other firms do? So, yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.